Hello everyone, welcome back to the next episode of Meeting Halfway, joined by me again, Mark, with my co-host Veronica. Hello. And we have a very special guest today. It is uh, Jell Lender. Hey there. You might know him by his works from Spongebob, Hey Arnold, and Fairly Odd Parents for those Never of you. Never Fairly Odd Parents. No. no. The That's IMDb interesting. lied to us. Yeah, oh, IMDb listed you it lies all as, day. It has so many episodes it said you worked on. It said like 20 episodes of Fairly Odd Parents. Story you hear by. that IMDb? I gave <laughs> up trying to correct IMDb a long time Interesting, because we looked at, we looked at uh, your site, and we looked at IMDb, and then we looked at <laughs> other like... Um, That's the thing, because I'm like, I'm a really big fan of like Fairly Odd Parents. So when Veronica was checking the MDB, she was like, "Oh, I've ne I never heard of him working on Fairly Odd Parents before, but here it is. It lists all the episodes individually too." I'm constantly surprised by the things that I worked on. When I look at my own listing. <laughs> I'm so glad. T, look, fun fact there. Yeah, but he also worked I, on a uh, Fairly Odd. Uh, not Fairly. <laughs> <laughs> no, he <we> didn't. <laughs> Phineas and Ferb is what I was gonna say. That one's true. I mean, I, I don't want you to worry that there's no reason to have me here today. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I did do a couple of things that are on my list. Yeah. So we, one of our um, biggest questions we wanted to start this off with was, you know, did you always want to work in animation? Was cartoons always your passion? It was always going to be animation or comic books. And, and I've been very lucky to work in both in my career. Um, when I was a little kid, my, my family, it, we are the, the lender's bagel lenders. Yeah, we, we, your father owns a bagel shop. Well, he, he's no head. longer here, but the, the family, my father, my uncles, they had uh, made this lenders bagels. It began with my, my grandfather, Harry, my father's father. In 1927, he came wow. over to America from Poland, brought the family over a year and a half later. My father was born nine months after that. <laughs> wow. And they ran the bakery in their garage, and in the early 60s, they experimented with freezing the bagels, and here we are. So I was one of those, and when I grew up, we had a big factory in Orange, Connecticut, and on weekends, I would go, you know, my, my dad wanted to get me out of the house, out of my mom's hair, <laughs> and sometimes he would take me to the factory, and we were there all the time because it was a family-owned business, and you just had reasons to go there, to go to the office for an event or a meeting or whatever it was, but I would go in on the weekends and we had the offices on top of the factory on the Boston Post Road in Orange. And I'd hang out with my dad for a couple of minutes, but it gets boring listening to him on the phone, making a sales call or something like that, yeah. watching the accountant or whatever, you know, it's, it's boring stuff. So I would go down to the factory and I'd look at all of the machinery and it was absolutely amazing this specialized machinery for making bagels. I mean, I could do an hour on just how cool that was. <laughs> Even if you couldn't see the, the, the machines, and, and you can't right now, there were stickers all over them that showed how dangerous they were. They would have <laughs> like a hand sticker with all of the fingers chopped off oh and flying God. through the air <laughs> with blood that would say danger. And, and they were dangerous. You know, you had like a big rotary slicing machine where the bagels are whipping around in a circle at 800 miles an hour oh so that they can be loaded into a little area where there's a buzzsaw that's going to chop them in, in, into pieces. So anyway, I'd see all that stuff and then eventually I would work my way upstairs to the art department with giant air quotes, which is where Willie Evans did all of the art. So he had started his career as an old style like poster painter guy. He would do the the special on tongue at the deli. He painted on the glass. The window, you know, yeah. Like, you know, two pounds of tongue for 49 cents, whatever it was that they had to do. It was what he did. So he painted with egg tempera paint on glass and he did posters and that kind of thing for sale stuff. So he had this very friendly neighborhood style that everyone could look at and feel like, oh, I get it. This is one of us who's making this artwork. He did cartoons and, and all of that stuff. And we incorporated that look into Lender's Bagels. So we had caricatures of my father, my Uncle Sam, and my Uncle Marvin Whoa. on the bag as the Lender men, which Willie initially designed. And then other cartoonists who came on board were involved. But anyway, I would go hang out with Willie. And he taught me how to set up an art desk and how to ink and how to roll out your brush. Wow. And how to do 
all of this cool stuff. And I was like, that's what I want to do. I'm much more interested in that than selling bagels or anything else that I'm looking at. It's this art stuff. So growing up in the 70s and then and then early 80s, it was animation or comic books. I was going to do one or the other. I've done both, I said. Yeah. So that was it. It was always going to be that. And I, as soon as I was old enough to start thinking about going to college, it was going to be art school. And, and from Connecticut, there was only Rhode Island School of Design or mm. maybe Parsons in New York. Was SCAD not a thing yet? No. Okay. No, it didn't, it didn't exist. And even if it had, from Connecticut, you couldn't see anything past yeah, the glow of Rhode say. Island. <laughs> so I, I tried out to get into Rhode Island School of Design. I luckily got in. And it's a great education there. You get one year, the first year, where they do nothing but foundation stuff. So you learn color, you learn sculpture, you learn drawing, you learn figure drawing, all of it before they let you specialize. Mm. So that's great because I got this sort of generalized art education, but then eventually you specialize and that's when I realized they couldn't train me to be an animator the way I wanted to be. They were focused on uh, festival animation, you know, super art house stuff, mm. yeah. at, which is great, but I wanted to do Bugs Bunny. And they were like, well, go to Cal Arts. They'll make you turn a head and it needs to be the same head all the way around. I'm like, that's what I want. Sign me up. So that was the first I'd ever heard of it. And that dragged me out to Los Angeles. And then once you're at Cal Arts, you're in the system and you meet people. And and uh, and eventually I worked my way out. That's great. Dang. I'm no. sorry if I jumped ahead <laughs> no, too far. I'm like, I'm like, oh, the bagel story. And I'm like, oh, God, I'm willing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, I, I grew up in Ireland, so I relate to that thing of like not really having much in terms of like the animation you want to do being available. So mm -hmm. I, I went to a university for a year for animation and I, I dropped out because it was just wasn't even like a, an animation school specific to um, with like no like English or math. Like I could only do animation it was still not giving me what I wanted. I, <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I, I decided to drop out whenever they started just giving us. They give us Rick and Morty model sheets, and we're just like, your homework is to go and trace that. And I was like, okay, uh, I think that's enough. <laughs> that was how uh, that was how my college was too. Mm -hmm. I went to Orange Coast College, um, and I, I went for animation. Um, but all they asked us to do was Richard Williams walk cycles, just replicate the Richard right. Williams walk cycle. Um, not not so much inspiring us to do our own thing. Just More so, it. yeah, yeah, just copying it, replicating With no it. Other technique. Yeah. I think there's there's a balance that that the schools need to achieve, and I don't know that they have, and and I don't know that they can because the industry has changed so much. Like when I got out into the into the business, and and when I got into college, I was looking to do this. I wanted to flip pages and create the illusion of life. Like uh, what I was interested in was being an animator not making animation yeah, uh, or making films. You know, when you suddenly realize, oh, this is actually the same thing as making films. We have some different techniques and some additional techniques because we can't just get in front of a camera and make it happen, although we can now. Yeah, um, yeah. Everything, everything changes. So it took me a couple of years of actually being out in the industry before I understood what it was that I wanted to do. Um, because even though CalArts was very focused on, on giving you practical skills that you could use in the industry, which is what I was missing from Rhode Island School of Design, because they were trying to teach me to be experimental, which is great when you want to be experimental. But when you want to do is but when what you want to do is get out into the business where it's like, we need to deliver a product. Here are the things you need to do. I, I needed to learn those skills and CalArts taught them to me as well as they could for an industry that was poised to be completely revolutionized yeah. in a million different ways. Like, you know, as I left CalArts or as I was in the middle of CalArts, that's when Disney came up with caps there computer aided production system or whatever it is that did all the digital ink and paint for them. Oh, really? And that was a whole class of jobs just whoosh, disappeared overnight, which 
you know, didn't necessarily affect the people that I was going to school with because we weren't really training to be cell anchors and cell painters yeah. and all of the rest of that. But it set the stage for a new class of people who would do different kinds of editing and, and filming and scene planning based on the new capabilities that were coming. Completely reformed portion of that. Yeah. 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 We've I seen mean, a lot more now with like, AI. You, you referenced earlier, yeah, the, the AI, like the whole movie made just with AI artwork and all, which is just crazy to me that that's seen as a good idea. I guess for a businessman, that's a good idea, but... I don't know. It seems so devoid of creativity. It, it is. Yeah, it's passionless. Uh, yeah. I, it, I mean, I guess at some point maybe they'll be able to simulate passion. I have no idea. They, yeah, they take <laughs> all the portions we, of passion. <laughs> take little parts really, of your soul and put it in the <laughs> Yeah, we, we don't know, but it, it's a losing game to pretend that, you know, oh, we have some magic spark. That, you know, the computers will never be able to do what we do. We're on the verge of we don't know what yeah yeah and it's it's all very scary and i feel like for my career it's just been you know rope a dope with things changing like you know when i started out we were doing all of the storyboarding on paper and i would kill myself if i had to storyboard on paper like i used to back then but we weren't prepared for how digital storyboarding would change the way animation feels because it's so easy to clone out a drawing yeah. that some of what used to be the, I don't know, the variation, the, the fluidity of the animation goes away. And, and that isn't necessarily a loss, but it's a stylistic change mm -hmm. that you can see in all of the like animation. There's a certain charm to it, yeah. It's yeah. It's gone in a way. Well, I mean, a Whereas, certain charm. There yeah, are new it's, charms. It's not worse. Yeah, it's just, it's yeah. different. It's yeah. different. Yeah. 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 yeah, like I look at a show and, and I've not seen a lot of it, but Teen Titans Go, and that is very much a digital show. You know, <laughs> yeah. The style of that show. Not because there's any quality that's not in it, but the style of that show is sort of an outgrowth of digital copy paste and, and kind that of, kind of thing. It's rigged, yeah. isn't it? It's, I think, yeah, yeah it's, it's rigged. rigged. Yeah. And I like thing. that style, yeah. I was going to say, Mark's working on a pilot right now that's rigged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that style is bad at all, but it certainly is different to that old yeah. school, like, yeah, cells and like... Uh, and, and we've got, you know, the, the technology that you can use now with 2D stuff allows us to have textural quality to the animation that we never had. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think we're still working out whether that, not whether it's a good thing, but how to make that, how to use that to the best advantage. Yeah. Um, you know, like Disney had some of that back in the 50s when they started going UPA with uh, Toot Whistle Plunk and Boom. They, there was a bit of that quality to their work, but they also sort of nailed exactly the right use of that and i'm not certain we've done that yet with the new technology but we've got some cool stuff like the mickey mouse say. shorts yeah, that we're doing i love those yeah. Yeah. we're starting to see like too with even like cgi all these movies coming out now that try to like replicate these like sketchy uh 2d like, like pencil the new drawings puss and yeah boots. the puss and boots yeah. and the that's new a good Ninja example Turtles yeah out, yeah I mean, even going back to Flushed Away and stuff like that. You yeah. know? Oh, we were digital, just watching that. Digital yeah. fingerprints yeah. On, yes. on the clay. <laughs> we were just, and they lowered the frame rate too. On yeah. the mouth movements, yeah. yeah. It's great. I mean, the, one nice thing about all this technology is that you can choose your look. That the technology doesn't have to determine your look like it did with Toy Story, I think. you know, Because yeah. it's new and we just need to see what we can do right now. And then there were a lot of years when we were very obsessed with this kind of silkiness and how high detail can we make like, it. Yeah. Like dinosaur. Like good dinosaur yeah. and stuff like that. Like yeah. all, like a lot of Pixar movies I find do that where they try to make everything really like hyper realistic and see what kind of cool realistic effect. They, they're making that new movie. The Elements. Elemental. And it, oh, yeah. it comes from, it seems like it comes from an idea of like, well, we can make these realistic effects. So let's, see let's what do, we can it, do yeah. it. Right. And I think people will get, I don't know if the audience will get tired of that, but you run up against this weird um, barrier of disbelief. Yeah, the like, uncanny valley. Where it's like at a certain yeah. point, why is this animated if you want to be like... like as real exactly, as possible. Exactly. I mean, like, are you are you getting any benefit out of animating it? And one of the things that, that I love about animation is this sort of stylistic, reductionist 
um, symbolic movement style that yeah. you can have. And the more realistic you go with the rendering of your world, the more out of place that feels. Yes. Definitely. And then we lose that. And and why would you want to lose that? You know, there there's some there's beauty in that. It's ballet. One good example um, that is like a, an overly textured and realistic looking animated movie, but it still is like stylistic is Rango. Where Rango was like it Which was, I need to see. That's a great one. That's a great one. Um I think it was Nickelodeon, wasn't it? It was Nickelodeon. Yeah. Um, um Johnny Depp. But it took them like days, I think days and days to like oh, render really. out because yeah. the textures were so high quality at the time. But they use that to their advantage by making everything like overly textured. And uh, the, yeah. the, it's like really cartoony character designs with these realistic textures on it that gives it a certain <laughs> charm to it. Yeah. But it doesn't look freaky. That's the one thing. Well, it looks, sometimes it looks intentionally so, okay. freaky. Sometimes, yeah. It, yeah, it does. But there's yeah. a reason for it, you know? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Another good example Horton Hears a Who. I love, yeah, that yeah. looks yeah. great. How was it uh, trying to break into the industry back then? It seems like it's maybe presumptuous, but it seems like it's it would be a lot harder to break into the industry now than it was back around those like early Nickelodeon days. Uh, I I would imagine it it's a lot harder now. Yeah. Um. There was a much smaller pool back then because, and I I can't stress this enough. It was not cool to be <laughs> in animation or to want to be in animation. Yeah. When when I grew up. It was incredibly weird to want to do this, um, and and no one even understood what I was talking about. I mean, cartoons. When I was growing up, cartoons were at low ebb. Um, the cartoons that we got on television were garbage, <laughs> and I feel like enough people are gone that I can say confidently that most of the stuff that came out from Filmation or Ruby Spears or, or whatever like that was deep. just sort of yeah. shovelware on television yeah. um, was garbage. And like, I, you know, I grew up watching The Secret Adventures, The Secret Life of Waldo Kitty. And you don't know it. Oh, and, no. and I don't want you to know it. <laughs> now we are when we're going to it. Was, it was stuff that was just put on TV to fill time and be as cheap as possible. This is just before the toy tie-ins really hit and, mm. and then things got cynical and <laughs> and cheap in some cases, but not necessarily bad uh, because they at least needed to appeal to the kids yeah. in order to sell the toys. <laughs> but yeah. prior to that, they didn't. They just needed to serve a kid audience. So we grew up watching a lot of garbage and also classic stuff. So I saw Warner Brothers cartoons, all, all of the color Warner Brothers cartoons, and plenty of them that were black and white but had been sent over to China or Korea so to be reanimated and colored um, at a lower frame rate, but they got the job done. So I saw all of that classic stuff. I saw the Disney stuff that they won't show you now because <laughs> we didn't know it wasn't cool back then, so we saw it. And we wanted desperately to be a part of that industry, mm -hmm. you know, the old animation industry. The classy animation industry. Or right. Classy, classic, sorry. And, and, and at just that time when I'm getting ready to go out to, to college, that was when um, Roger Rabbit hit. Oh. And because the boomers had gotten old enough to start making the movies and making the decisions in yeah. Hollywood, yeah. they're like, we want to see what we used to do so you get Roger Rabbit and you get Tiny Toon Adventures, which, you know, at least is aware of the past yeah. and found a good way to process it for the future. But they're trying. They're desperately trying. Um, that stuff was starting to happen just as I was going out into college and getting ready to join the business. I remember sitting down uh, at a, a theater in Valencia, Disney rented a theater and ran The Little Mermaid for us wow. before it came out. And we were all just like, we're back. It was absolutely amazing. And and it was, uh, so, so the industry was starting to explode as, you know, get, you, no surprise, you make good products and suddenly people are interested in your cartoons again yeah. so the little mermaid comes out roger rabbit comes out and everything is off and running and there was nobody on deck to be in the industry but weirdos like me at that time even so because i was not a rock star at, at uh, cal arts 
it took me almost a year and a half before I got my first job. Wow. And I would go every week, I'd go out with my portfolio. And portfolio back then is a gigantic black case <laughs> that you'd, ca you'd lug around with you from one studio to the next. And I would drop it off. And they'd say, you know, we're not really taking portfolios this week. Come back in two weeks. Oh. And I'd come back in two weeks and walk in the door with my portfolio. And they'd say, oh, you should have been here last week. We hired three people. Oh, my God. I, I missed it <laughs> over and over and over again. You know, part of that is is luck of the draw. And part of it is who you know. And I didn't yeah. know enough people. And I didn't have an unbelievable Pete doctor portfolio. You know, he was plucked off the vine and, and dragged up to Pixar. He's in my class. You know, all those people were in my class. So, so when you would drop off your portfolios, <clears throat> would you test? Like, would they offer tests? Sometimes they offered tests. Um, I did a Duckman test. Oh, I wow. Think, I think I did a rock, uh, Rugrats test. <laughs> Eventually, I did a Hey Arnold test. I would not do them now, now and it's not because I'm established. It's because they're wrong. Mm. They are ethically wrong. It's the employer's job to test people out and take the risk on them. You want me to test? Pay me to test. Yeah. Yeah. Or <laughs> hire me, and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But you can't push the burden of that onto an, a, a potential employee, especially when it doesn't even guarantee them a job if they do a good Yeah, we one of our friends recently, uh, yeah. who, who currently <laughs> works in the industry came in and was telling us about that um, a couple weeks back. Hi there. For a show that just came out, they had done a bunch of unpaid tests just to get like hired on for it. And mm -hmm. there was only like a temporary gig on it too. There was a friend of mine who did a test for a show. I won't say, um, but yeah, it was an eight hour test session mm -hmm. uh, in-house unpaid. Um, during a, like a weekday, so they had to take the day off uh, their current union job yep. to test for this job, and they didn't even get right. it. If they wanted to pay, then I'm totally fine with it. I mean, it's it's paid work, and let them take the risk. But and I know what their their argument would be: a, it's always been this way, and b, what if we get stuck with a bad employee? Well, what if you do get stuck with a bad employee? That's your job. That's your risk as also, the employer. Isn't there like a contingency, like, you know, probation? Isn't there like a probationary period? Well, they can they can make whatever they want, yeah. um, assuming it doesn't conflict with some union law. Yeah, I think but, that's... But then how does this not conflict <clears throat> with the union laws? Because you know? the union doesn't ask for it. Mm. it I mean, <laughs> the union can only get what it asks for. Yeah. And they have traditionally not asked for a lot. I think we have a very different union now from the one that we had 15 years ago or 20 years ago, <clears throat> which was sort of weakened. I mean, when I was at Nickelodeon, it was a non-union studio. Why? It's union now because... I tried to bring in the WGA along with a bunch of other people. We all signed cards and Nickelodeon lost their minds. <laughs> and the 839 saw an opportunity to come in and say, well, we'll represent the writers so that you don't have to worry about the WGA. And suddenly Nickelodeon was a union studio. And I'm glad that I was able to contribute in that way, but I'm also sorry that that writers of cartoons are never going to get the deal that yeah. writers of yeah. live action will get. I was going to say, it seems like studios can get away <laughs> with that because, like you said, the pool is so much bigger in our that if, like, these people demand this stuff, then there's, like, a whole, like, truckload of other people who are willing to do it for much less just to get their, like, foot in the door mm -hmm. in the industry. Yeah. Right. So in the end, it was it, we sort of scared Nickelodeon into becoming an 839 signature. Good. <laughs> Good. But that wasn't the goal. We were like, what happened? Well, at least to, like, get some sort of support, you know? Yeah. That's yeah, I mean, all that, that matters. It, it puts the mechanism in place. And then it's up to the union, which means it's up to union members to agitate for things that they need. And historically at least in in the recent term, the 839 hasn't done that, but I, I can tell that it's a different bunch of people now, yeah. which is great. Um, you know, the, the same generation, if we can get into to Boomer versus <laughs> Zoomer talk, the same generation that has made things difficult in a lot of other areas, made things difficult in the 839 by, you know, sort of settling into a mode of partnership with, the companies which 
are not really your partners. Yeah. And and then just accepting that things are the way they are. And, and you know, I'm sure that somewhere in there, there's a little bit of I got mine. Um, but the new generations that are coming up do not play that. And I love it. Yep, they won't. They won't put up for... Uh, and, <clears throat> and especially with uh, everyone being a lot more vocal nowadays with yeah. things, with everything. Um, everything's kind of transparent while trying to be transparent. Um which I think I think it's, it just benefits it benefits the workers of anything, mm-hmm. you know. Um, we we had a, a guest on our podcast not too long ago. Uh, her name is Margot, and she she works in um, she works she's a part of the union. Telling us how gr- like how much the union is really sticking their necks out for um, a lot of the animators currently or artists currently, um, which makes me feel more confident knowing that the people are being supported. And, it's great. Know? I mean. You, we are the the union, yeah. so what we do is what the union does, and I think it's just a different variety of person who's in the union right now. Yeah, we wanted to ask you, um, going to going into Hey Arnold, um, we wanted to know what was one of your favorite episodes to work on because we saw some of the the boards you had posted on Twitter on the the Pigeon Man episode, which I personally right. love, um, and okay, this might be incorrect, but. Did you work on uh, what's opera, Arnold? A little bit. Before we do that, Mm -hmm. I I feel like I need to finish your previous question because we were talking about how I got into the industry. Of course, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, don't be sorry. I I mean, I got off too. (laughs) So I I had been trying forever to get a job like that. It was not until I got a phone call from my mentor at the time, Ken Bruce, who was one of my teachers at CalArts and had become a friend. And he, he was working on Ren and Stimpy at the time. And, and back in those days, there was no Nickelodeon studio. Uh, there wasn't actually a facility. We were in rented space all over town. So Ren and Stimpy was in an office building on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. And uh, Hey Arnold, which was about to get started, was at 4040 Vineland in North Hollywood. And I was living in Valencia because why would I move before I had a job? (laughs) I was just camping out in my apartment. And Ken called me up one day and said, I heard they're hiring for a new show called uh, called Hey Arnold. They're hiring today. Go now, now, now. And I ran out of the apartment building like phones spinning in the air like a cartoon (laughs) and drove 90 miles an hour down to Burbank. And I was the first person in the door sitting in the lobby when they started asking who wants to take a test. That's great. And was that the creator, Craig Bartlett, there doing that? Or Yeah, no, it was Craig Bartlett. I think at that time it would have been Craig Bartlett and some production staff and Tuck Tucker who had Aww. worked on the, the pilot with him. And, you know, one or two other people. And I took a test. But the bottom line was a connection, a personal connection on the inside gave me the timing so mm-hmm. I didn't have to deal with come back in two weeks or you should have been here last week. Yeah, yeah. I was there exactly at that moment. So absent uh, an unbelievable resume, absent a, a, you know, a personal connection because, you know, let me back up a little bit. A new show starts. First, they hire their friends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then they hire friends of friends. Then you hire whoever's sitting in the lobby. Because if you don't know someone and you don't have a personal recommendation for that person, you just need asses in seats. Yeah. And that's when you do have to just try someone out. So you look out into the lobby, you see who's there. I was there because Ken Bruce called me and told me when to be there. So luck for me and a, you know a sort of tangential connection to Hey Arnold made the difference and ended a year and a half streak of unemployability not even unemployment but unemployability and that got it started okay so now you're talking about favorite episodes yeah pigeon man pigeon man was sort of like a big break for me on hey arnold when i was hired on hey arnold I i did my test and it was a test for storyboard and i'm like yeah this is what i want this is why i got out of theatrical animation which i was in for a a split second I worked on Page Master. Oh, wow. I had the lowest possible, and I'm backing up again. I had the lowest possible job back then in animation. I was a special effects in-betweener. 
So my animator would bring me the first drawing like the of first pixie dust. <laughs> he brought me pixie dust. You know, 800 dots going across the screen because Whoopi Goldberg, who is a fairy in, book, yep. flies through. Ugh. And then he would give me the last frame, but he wouldn't draw the dots. He would just draw two lines to indicate the spread as they spread yeah. out when it fell. And then he'd hand it to me and say, go. And I spent six weeks or whatever. Oh, but those effects are beautiful. They're, they're beautiful. <laughs> I mean, it's it's great and and it's handmade which it would not be now because yeah. you know we'd be using a generator or whatever and yeah and some procedurally CG, generated uh, like and, and it would be very cool like a flock simulator we've done something really cool and this one dot goes its own direction whatever and that's neat but yeah it had a super warm quality and i did it and i also had to animate macaulay culkin's glasses flying oh. along and like this was my big moment as an animation in between or an effects in between or on page master. I went to my animator because there was a moment when the glasses needed to turn as they were going. And I said, hey, John, how about if when the glasses get here and you can see the arm bar through the lens, I make the arm bar thicker. <laughs> and he was like, you do that, Lender. <laughs> and I drew it and I was like, yes, I have made an impact. I called you Lenser so, from that point on. Hmm? <laughs> Lenser. <Yeah. laughs> so I, that, I did that for a while. And that was when I realized, you know, I've spent eight weeks here, my entire time on this, this show, working on 12 seconds of animation. And it just wasn't, it wasn't enough scope for my yeah. work, which is why when I went to Hey Arnold, I did the test for... Um, background for I'm sorry for uh, uh, storyboard. So I did my test and they're like, yeah, you're okay. You can be on the fourth rotation when it comes in. Your partner will be coming in in four weeks. But in the meantime, you want a job? And I was like, yeah, I'll take a job. So they said, why don't you do some background design for the show? And I made the mistake over the month or month and a half or whatever it was waiting for my rotation to come on storyboard i made the mistake of distinguishing myself in background design which was a lower paying job than storyboard mm. so when the rotation came up now they have to ask themselves do we want jay doing this job that we know he does well or do we want to take a risk on having him do this other thing that we don't know if he can do and costs us more Jay, why don't you stay over there? Oh. So I got stuck in background design and I would agitate every once in a while and say, I need some storyboard. You guys promised me a storyboard job. And they'd throw me a little bit of, uh, you know, revision work or can you do the sequence or whatever? And I was very happy to get it. And it was good training ground. And one of those moments was Pigeon Man where I had really agitated. I'm not a full storyboarder yet, but they're like, do the end of Pigeon Man. So everything from the moment when Arnold comes out of the stairwell on, on the roof to the end is my stuff. And back then I couldn't draw very well and I was still learning storyboard. And I, I think in a good way, I didn't understand the rules. So I was able to really step outside of the rules yeah. in some cases. and and do things that I would probably find shocking if I did now, you know, <laughs> angles that are that are just, you know, maybe a, a little bit more than is necessary, more interesting, or I don't know. Um, but I, I didn't know what I was doing. And I'm drawing all this stuff and I'm shading everything because I had to cover up for the fact that the drawings themselves <laughs> sucked. And my supervising director, Jamie Mitchell, would come by every once in a while and say, don't gild the lily lender. And it took me years to understand what he was talking about once I did realize, A, how to draw, and B, that no one would ever see any drawing that I ever did, which is a key thing you need to understand about storyboard, that someone is going to follow you and redraw or, and redo absolutely every single thing that you do. Yeah. So it doesn't need to be perfect it needs to communicate and it needs to communicate so much that when it gets copied and dumbed down, not intentionally, but just through generational change, yeah. that there's still something left. Anyway, um, I was so happy to work on, on Pigeon Man 
I, I back in those early days of Hey Arnold, I was as involved as they would let me be with storytelling. So I used to go to the writers' meetings and just sit there and listen and probably pipe up every once in a while <laughs> because I didn't know what the, the rules were. Um, and I, I felt like I was really involved. And I think everyone knew that that one was an incredibly cool story. I think, I think the thing that I love about it is that it's a down ending yeah. Yeah. on a show for kids. Pigeon Man is not going off happy. He, he recognizes that he can never be happy in a way that satisfies regular people. That he knows what his limitations are. And Arnold has to learn that he can't just be the traveling angel and come in and solve everyone else's problems in 11 minutes. That some people are just going to be uncomfortable and part of what makes them comfortable and part of what solves their problem is you accepting their limitations. It's yeah. an incredibly subtle message um, and a, a down ending for a kid's show. And I love that. And I think kids crave it. Because, Absolutely. You know, they understand. Like, we, we, we want everything in animation. When I say we, I mean the industry. And when I say the industry, I mean executives. <laughs> executives want everything to be familiar and comfortable and unchallenging for kids because we don't want to get the letters. We don't want to to make anyone uncomfortable. Yeah. But that elicits and, some kind of reaction, which is a good thing. It's better than nothing, you know? Well, Even if it is like a kid being sad, that's, they're, you know, you're evoking that right. emotion from them, which we I think is feel, special. We feel like that's valuable yeah. because yeah. we're storytellers. They don't feel like it's valuable because when that one angry letter comes across their desk, it it burns down their whole life yeah. you know, for an executive. But it shows that the kid cared about the characters, you know, which is yeah. so important. Like, but it's not and, the kid sending the letter all the time, yeah. you know. But and, I, yeah, as a kid, I always find myself gravitating towards those kind of like bittersweet endings more. Exactly, Absolutely. because they help you process your world and kids need that too because we can pretend that kids' lives are simple, but... Their dog just died, and grandma's got cancer in the next room, and someone bullied them at school. Their lives are real. They're dealing yeah. with COVID. <laughs> yeah, and we don't give them tools to process their lives. And, and an episode like that of Hey Arnold, um, episodes that are willing to have down endings, uh, those are useful to kids, and I think they crave it. I think they, yes. they want that. Pigeon Man messed my was, shit the up fact as that a people kid. People are still talking about it to I, this day. Shows that I cry every time I watch that yeah. episode. It oh, it Me tears too. my heart up. I, I think we we knew when we were doing it. This is this is a really great episode. I mean, for that it, it can bring an adult to tears in eleven minutes, and that's. Can I swear here? Yeah. That's fucked up. I and know. And it's great. It's fucked up in a really good oh. way. And the more of that that we allow ourselves to do, the better. And, you know, if I ever get my own show, my own show has, and there's a, there is a show, it has that feeling built in, you know, where things aren't necessarily resolved, but we acknowledge the problems that kids have. It's such uh, a, I, oh, like I, I always loved that idea. A really good example is, is Mr. Rogers. Mr. Yeah. Rogers touches on like death on, and like hurt feelings mm -hmm. and being okay, feeling angry or sad or upset. And even Sesame Early Sir, Se or like older Sesame Street did like the episode of Big Bird when Mr. Hooper dies, mm -hmm. you know, and like that's something that makes like as a as a child growing up and watching that made you feel like you were a person who can feel these things, you know, it, it helps you process that. Yes, exactly. I mean, we needed it. I mean, I grew up with Mr. Hooper. So when, and I was an adult by the time he died or, or at least very close to it. So it didn't hit me the same way necessarily, but I absolutely got the need for that episode. And I'm shocked that people don't want to take that on yes. all the time. It's so, it's like so bizarre to me. Cause like my thought, is, my thought is like for watching like television as a kid, like you're an adult and you want your child to watch television. You would want them to learn, right? learn about emotions, learn about how to, how to react, um, how not to react, you know, those things. Um, and like Pigeon Man, oh, Pigeon Man is such a great example of that also the Christmas episode, Mr. Nguyen, oh. 
That, oh my God. Oh. It's amazing. <laughs> it makes me want to cry. <laughs> I love it. I love, I love Hey Arnold. <laughs> so much of the episodes you've done, like, I'm like, oh. <laughs> I, I, I think it was, you know, it was a very different time, particularly at Nickelodeon. Um, they were an upstart channel. You know, they had no way to compete against Disney. You cannot jump into the pool with that monster yeah. Yeah. and beat them at their own game. So they were the network that thumbs its nose at parents, you know, with gack and, yep. and fart noises. And gross and out humor. All of the rest of that stuff. And it wasn't really until SpongeBob happened when they suddenly had turf that they got conservative. And it's, it's a perfectly understandable and predictable reaction, but the consequences of it are, are unfortunate because we yeah. lose that that I I'll, I'll say maverick spirit you lose that quality that lets them do things that they consider risky yeah yeah you could definitely feel that a lot of shows were trying to like replicate that same magic that SpongeBob had or at the very least when a show came along and and didn't do that and was trying to like do its own thing Nickelodeon wouldn't really give it a chance I remember everyone really liked that um the C.H. Greenblatt cartoon, Harvey Beaks, when mm -hmm. it came out, and it did not get a chance right. to... I, that That's another show where I haven't watched a bunch of it, but I, I've seen clips that like do focus on that. Like They have a whole episode where like like a main character dies and it's treated seriously with like severity, um, but a show like that can't exist on a network that's just trying to like sh make more SpongeBob. Yeah, I mean, they, yeah. They, they get uh, addicted to the money, and they're a corporation. That's what they do. Yeah. I, I get it. But I'm sure that you can't get out of any kind of um, internal pitch meeting there without hearing the phrase "the next SpongeBob." Mm -hmm. I mean, uh. how do you how do you convince upper management that we're aiming a little lower financially yeah. with this show? I mean, they, they, that doesn't yeah. track with anybody. No, that's so like creatively soul sucking. <laughs> like, uh. yeah. So I mean, I think as as creators. If we're willing to take a risk, you need to identify where who are the risk takers right now. Yeah, you know who were uh, ten years ago. It was Netflix. You know they had to come up with stuff that was going to drag eyeballs away from Disney and Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network. Yeah, um, I don't know who those people are going forward because there's so much media consolidation. But maybe <laughs> it's independent stuff. A lot. We were talking about this like literally last night. Yeah. Is I, indie animation online is like. I can hope it's the it's going to be like the next the next big thing. Yeah, the, yeah. the question is, will people like YouTube allow you to monetize that, or are they going to say, "Oh, this show's doing really well. Let's change the formula so that we get more of the money." Yeah. yeah. And they've or, done that historically. Yeah. Or, or, or this show is doing well, and then a, a studio comes in and takes it and wants to make it like official, like on on a big network, and they kind of like simplify it. And like water it down to something exactly. more remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Although I will say, um, Smiling Friends, if you haven't seen Smiling Friends yet. I haven't. Um, and, and before you go on, because I want to hear about it, but of course. I, I feel like I need to say that I don't watch a lot of animation. <laughs> That's and okay. There, there's a specific reason for it. I, I watch what my, my kids watch, and now they're getting older, so they don't watch much. But if I watch a cartoon, there are only two reactions I can have. Either, damn it, they fucked it up. Or, <laughs> I wish I were working on that. And <laughs> either one of those things is a miserable experience for me. So most of the time, I'm just like, forget it. I can't. I mean, I know I'm supposed to be watching all of this stuff. And at some point, I need to be current. I need to understand what, what people are interested in. If only so I can run the other direction. <laughs> yeah. But I, I've just sort of gotten out of the habit, especially where SpongeBob is concerned. I, I can imagine. Yeah, I, I saw on your Twitter there was you drew a, a photo where I was like, "That's it. That's what I've been feeling about this for the longest time." Where you you drew a picture of like all these wacky SpongeBob faces, and it was like for every one hundred of these. There are, should, be should be one of these. Or for every one of these, should be, should be 100 right. of like a normal, a like serious simple or simple. Yeah. And, and I have not watched SpongeBob, so I'm. this is not me commenting on the show. It really isn't. <laughs> yeah. No, I get um, it. But, you know, I just, I, I definitely can't do that because there's a, a weird sense of ownership. Yeah. Not that I have any ownership. But I know what you mean. But it's like, you know? I was there at the beginning and we all helped raise this baby and now it's this gigantic international monster hit and has been 
for two decades. And it's like, I, I don't want to know where it has gone through drift and drift is, is necessary and exciting. It needs to be made relevant and, and it needs to, to somehow resonate with a modern audience. And maybe the best way to do that is to take a break at some point. Yeah. I don't know none of my business, but I, I just don't watch it because I, I think, you know, even Steve understood that after those first three years, something new was going to happen. We were entering a new phase. Yeah. I don't know where I, I could source this. I'll try find it. But I remember seeing an article somewhere or like a post that was talking about like Steven Hillenberg. And it was like <clears throat> um, something like after the first three seasons, he went on like holiday or something like that. And he saw like uh, like a vending machine with like SpongeBob plaster all over it. And he was like this is something bigger than I could have ever like, yeah. this is beyond me at this point. I mean, you can see it even in the third season yeah. That, yeah. that we had started to get slick and <laughs> slickness is not a good quality for SpongeBob. I, I think one of the things that makes it so great, particularly first season is how wonky it is. Yes. That's something that you can clearly see the shift. Like, well, it obviously, it starts getting digitally colored in, like, what, the second season? Second season, yeah. Um, but in the third season, it's, like, way more polished. The lines are, like, a little thicker and, like, they're way smoother. And yeah. Like, well, you, you end up with a, a crew in the United States who finally understands how to draw this. Yeah. <laughs> and then you end up with a crew overseas that it understands how to it. draw it. And you start, you know... It's like a formula. It, you're, so. running, you're running your own visuals back through your own... Yeah. system it gets like and saturated it, it gets very yeah. slick you find that happening with um <clears throat> i don't know controversial figure uh, john john cat I, I look at his uh his like newer ren and stimpy drawings and it's like you've drawn oh. this for the past 30 years and it's just gotten to this thing that it's like telephone not even yeah it's like telephone exactly yeah um where it doesn't even resemble what it, it was at the start but yeah um, you look at cans without labels and then you look at you look at like the pilot and you're like what happened here yeah no, but with spongebob I mean, it definitely was that thing where yeah i love the season one artwork and even like season two um where it is like wonky and you could get away with there's more like goofy expressions there's more, yeah, there is funny humor smiles. in that yeah <laughs> we, we had no idea how to draw spongebob for all of first season i mean everyone was struggling oh, those are the best ones too those yeah. are the best well, spongebob you, you get weird stuff i mean i think it forces you into this sort of warner brothers mode where you're really concerned about how can i just get this drawing that i need and we didn't have <laughs> A, a model that we understood. It wasn't until we started looking at, at Sherm Cohen's stuff, and it's going to sound in the context of this discussion like I'm slamming Sherm, and I'm absolutely not, because nobody draws SpongeBob as well as he does. Um, we we were all like, oh, what, we need to do what Sherm is doing. <laughs> and then eventually Sherm's stuff became the basis for, for most of the models. And it's great, but you lose that sort of cloud of fun yeah, around I mean. Sherm's stuff and around whatever the, the model is that that kind of keeps everything lively when everyone is constantly trying to get back to the model. Get How do I get to zero? How do I make it look like, you know, worst of all, like um, the marketing artwork? Yeah. How do I make this look like the slicks? Yeah. And that's that's never good for any show but yeah. a, a show that sort of made its bones on being weird i think it hurts it more it than came others. way more polished that, that's and... something i feel like is lost uh, like that part the charm that's lost <laughs> with a lot of rigged cartoons is that yeah you're all you're always um fairly odd parents is a good example because fairly odd parents switched to rigs in season 10 and they're using the model sheet version of Timmy. And I realized when watching that, I was like, they never used the model sheet version <laughs> ever, ever they, in the show. Yeah. When they do, though, it's always like a poster. I, anytime it happens, I'm like, I'm like, I hate the way he looks there. And then you find out that's the model <laughs> sheet version. I, I think, you know, you're going to see that some shows benefit from this, this kind of slickness and others don't. Like Phineas and Ferb started out as a slick looking show. That's yeah. just, yeah. you know, Dan's style. Um, translated to animation, it has this quality to it. So I don't think that show is going to drift in a way that looks strange. Not but at SpongeBob all. was so handmade back then. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and not just in terms of 
scratches and shines and cell shadow and all the rest of that. But just because how it was drawn. Yeah, I mean, Steve's style just had this really lumpy, organic quality to it. Seems, you know, much more like the old uh, Klasky Chupo stuff than certainly fairly odd parents. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. UPA inspired. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say very <laughs> Hanna Barbera looking thick mm -hmm. outlines. Yeah. But yeah, like. Uh, Fairly Odd Parents is a really good example of how that charm is also like it's been polished so much that it's just like it's, right. it's lost. yeah it's like, lost the, everything. I, I'd argue the best season of that show look uh, visually is, <laughs> is season, season zero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the oh yeah cartoon shorts. I love yeah. those ones so yeah. much. And season one. Season, season one, one keeps that, and then you see it gradually get more and more sterilized by as season it goes four. On. It's just yeah, yeah. It's, every show does that. Every, yeah, exactly. every show is going to become slick, and and they're. You can combat it, or you can lean into it, or you can take a break. Yeah. Yeah. But some shows want that. Though. Like you said, um, <clears throat> Phineas and Ferb, and I never felt like that hindered it at, at all, ever. No. So it's a very, like, that. the The comedy in that show comes from how it's written, less on, like, the way, like, <laughs> mm -hmm. the characters are drawn. Yeah, the dialogue. Um, yeah. yeah. What's going on? <laughs> um, yeah, you worked on, uh, you were a, a writer on that show, or a storyboard artist? Um, um, I, on Phineas and Ferb? Yeah, I, I think was, that was I was a director. Oh, a director, um, okay. So the writing happened in a writer's room. Mm -hmm. We had premises on that show, just like we had on, on SpongeBob. And then we would hand it off to the storyboard team, and they would sort of write as they went. And, you know, I was, I would see the premises early on. I would give them notes. They might make changes. They might not then. Sometimes I would hand out to the storyboard team. Sometimes Dan or Swampy would hand out. And then eventually there would be a show and it would be mine mm -hmm. in the animatic room. And in the animatic room, I would, you know, you'd have to make cuts, you yeah. make new lines, you come up with a new idea for a gag, you yeah. realize something isn't working in the story. And it's my discretion as the director at yeah, that point was... to just remake it. We would sit there drawing all day and, and <laughs> I'd say, the scene is ready. And I would instantly hand off the panels to the uh, editor who would plug them in instantaneously. And then I'd jump up and record temp dialogue or whatever. <laughs> um, it was working with clay. And it's the for me, it's the most fun. My whole, my whole career has been working from the specific to the general, so I started out with you know special effects in betweening dealing with little details in animation and then storyboarding when i left nickelodeon i got into pure writing so i was writing in video games for eight years and wow. doing I, I saw you Willy Wonka yeah. Charlie yeah. And the <clears throat> Factory. all kinds of stuff and, <laughs> and i did comic books and I, I learned writing and then came back to uh, phineas for directing so dan brought me in and said can you do this job and i'm like i don't know i'll try so I got there and now you're working top down. Someone hands you all of this raw yeah, material yeah. and you have to craft it into a show because as much as we want to think that a script is the show or the storyboard is the show or whatever, it, nothing is the show until there's an animatic. Yeah. yeah. Because it's the second you put it into animatic, you realize, oh, this is eight minutes too long and now <laughs> everything needs to be changed or, oh, this isn't actually funny. Or this idea doesn't track whatsoever. What's going to make this idea work properly? How do I seed it? And it's not that they failed early on. It's that you can only see so far. Everyone yeah. can only see so far. And director is sort of the last line of defense before you go out to animation and start committing the bucks. Yeah. yeah. And I loved that sort of top-down view of everything just being Put able to shape together. and mold and yeah. let him cook. <laughs> it was, it was so much fun. And I feel like that was the job where my skills are, are put to use. If I, I'll go back to my Nickelodeon days, I'm doing background design. I'm doing storyboard, whatever I'm doing there. Sherm. I love Sherm. Um, Sherm said that my skill, the thing that I have is deconstructo vision. I can look at whatever is in front of me and tell you what's wrong with it and how to fix it. Doesn't mean that starting from the blank page, I can get you there. Mm -hmm. But when you give me the stuff, I can tell. So that's a director's skill. And I felt like on Phineas, I finally found where I was supposed to be. 
Um, so I love that job. That's oh. that's as good as it gets. And it, and that show was so much fun <laughs> and so challenging. I mean, you the, have to work around the the formula of it being the yeah, same the, every episode. The, the <laughs> formula is it's so incredibly disciplined and it's so rigid. Like we have this way that everything goes, and now the trick is finding a way to adhere to that formula and play with that formula and upset that formula, but still adhere yeah. to that <laughs> formula. And every episode needs to find a different way to do it and another way to be weird. And it was so much fun. And I, I was, and I came in a little bit late. I was there. Um, I helped down a little bit with the pilot. Oh, wow. I did a little bit of, of uh, storyboard cleanup or storyboard on that. And then there was a big meeting when it was all done where Dan pitched it to me and Martin Olson and uh, a whole bunch of other people, who some of whom worked on the show and some of whom didn't. Mm -hmm. And we all gave notes and then they went out and actually made this pilot. And when they picked it up, Dan called me up and said, do you want to come work on the show? And I was like, no, I don't want to work in animation anymore. I'm angry because I got run out of Nickelodeon. Nah, nah, nah. And I didn't want to do it. And that was, I don't know, 2000 six or, or 2007 yeah and i was still working in in video games and comic books and writing on the outside with my partner mike partner micah wright and in 2008 when the economy went into the dumper there Oof. wasn't enough video game work yeah. to support both micah and me so i called dan and i'm like do you have anything for me to do and he did have a job which was opening up in direction so that's how i ended up there and it was my big return to animation. And I, oh. uh, you know, I, I wish I had never left, but I had to leave when I left. Yeah, that completely makes sense. What were you, and uh, I was run out. Yeah, I was going to ask, <laughs> was, what were you uh, yeah. run out for? Was it the union? It was stuff? the union thing. I, I was blacklisted at Nickelodeon and by Nickelodeon. Ooh. There were people high up at Nickelodeon who made the call to the other studios and said, don't work with this guy and, and a couple of other people. Does Jesus. that still, does that still like? No, um, the cultural memory lasts, you know, between three to 10 years yeah, at the... a company like that. So by the time I got back to animation and it was seven, eight years later, it was probably three years or two years after the end of the actual blacklist. Yeah. Um, you know, at that point, I I might have been able to sneak back in, um, maybe not at Nickelodeon, but elsewhere. Um, but, you know, it was safe. I was just bitter. Mm. And I, I didn't want to do it. So That's I fair. stayed out probably longer than I needed to. But coming back in a directorial position, you know. And on a great on show. On a great I mean, show, I, yeah. I've really been very, show. very lucky to work on really great shows and mostly really great shows. Like even, I, I, there was a brief moment when I was at Nickelodeon, I was doing my background stuff and I couldn't get that storyboard job when I said, I'm leaving if you don't give me the storyboard job. And they were like, go, goodbye. So I went. And I went to uh, Film Roman, which was the company that was... Uh, doing The Simpsons yes, back yes. then. And they, you know, they were one of those animation companies that made all the Saturday morning shows back then. And they were doing a show called Sea Bear and Jamal, <laughs> which is about a little kid living in South Central and his magical teddy bear voiced by Tone Loke. And it it's actually a, a charming show and, and one of the first shows with a, a black cast. Um, of characters, if not voices, I don't really, I don't know who all of the voices were, but it dealt with that, with black American culture and issues that, you know, with South Central, like stuff that wasn't normal, but that's what we were talking about back then. You yeah. had Boys in the Hood and a lot of stuff. It was starting to come out and it was really cool to work on it. And they hired me to do storyboard. So that was my first real storyboard job was working on that show. And I was there for a couple of months and doing, you know, fun stuff that I, you know, got to work with fun characters and do some cool dialogue and, and learn my craft. And then Nickelodeon called me back because the math had changed. So in the beginning, the question is, do we want Jay doing this thing or this other thing? 
Now the question is, do we want Jay here at all? Do we want him doing work for a different studio? Right. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you know, they knew that I understood the show. So when the moment came for them to hire another storyboarder, we can get, you know, some unknown from the outside or we can get Jay, who at least really knows what's going on. And wanted it, yeah. Yeah. So that's what brought me back. I forget what got me onto that. <laughs> uh, um, can I, how much uh, crossover is there between these shows? Like, <laughs> obviously, you went from Hey Arnold to uh, SpongeBob and then to Phineas and Ferb. Uh, I know uh, John Fine, who worked on uh, Early Fairly Odd Parents, he was saying hi at a certain point. Like, Disney came in and like poached a bunch of the. Fairly Odd Parent staff to make a show for them. I think it was like Ying Ying Yang, Ying Yang, Yang Yo. Yo. Uh, and stuff like that. How much crossover is there in the industry between <clears throat> like all these different shows? Well, it, it, there's always a tendency to stay with the company that you're with now just because it's convenient. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know everybody, you've got your 401k there, yada blada. You know, you don't have to worry about how am I gonna get there in the mm -hmm. morning. All of that stuff, you know, it makes you want to stay where you are and they want to keep you around. So when a show would go on hiatus, which would happen every once in a while, you, know, you finish up an order for SpongeBob of 13 episodes and then we're going to take a break for a month or two months or whatever it is. Now they might just send you packing. Mm. But back then, especially at Nickelodeon, they were concerned with building up a Nickelodeon staff. Yeah. So they would find you something to do on cat dog or fairly odd parents or angry beavers or whatever it was sense, yeah. and that's how i ended up doing muscular beaver five <laughs> i mean i don't think mitch shower was looking to have me work on on angry beavers yeah. <laughs> but he had an episode that needed to be done and nickelodeon wanted to place me so that i wouldn't go off and be unavailable yeah. for the next yeah. season of spongebob i feel like now so much so many animation employees are like freelance, you know? They just yeah. brought to work on yes. like for a couple months and then leave, you know? And they have to find they another have to job. keep finding work. <laughs> yeah, which seems... Because the they one don't want to give the them benefits. Yeah, about <laughs> the industry is that it seems like so, like... I don't know what the word is. Like, you, you have this job that is not stable at all. And you you know that you are only going to have it for a couple months. Mm -hmm. And then you have to look for work again, which can take months to a year because... Everyone is looking for work yeah. all the time. It's the consequence of a bunch of things, but primarily that there are so many people who want to be in animation right yeah. now. Yeah. Especially around this area. They mm -hmm. can treat us as fungible. Back when I was at Nickelodeon, that was still that generation, that Gen X crowd that I came in with, where it was uncool to be an animator. Yeah. So, you know, they had to jealously guard the few of us who were willing to do something that uncool. They you don't want to, want to lose, you. Yeah. yeah. You don't want to lose me to another studio because where the hell are you going to find someone else who's willing to do this? Yeah, so. I feel like that is a result of of um, you guys making so many like inspirational and like massive cartoons that so many kids growing up with those did say like, look at that and say like, I want to do that when I grow up. Yeah, Absolutely. I know I had that reaction. You you yeah. did too. Yeah, and we got paid well. I mean, I I got paid not good Hollywood money. But I got paid good money yeah. to do that work. Um, I mean, we're the worst paid people in Hollywood, especially <laughs> when you figure in how much money our stuff makes over the long haul yep. yeah. and through merchandising. But when you compare me with people I went to high school with who didn't get into, you know, finance or, you know, medical or uh, yeah. legal, then I'm doing OK. Yeah. You know? Or when I'm working, I'm doing OK. So I wanted to ask, this is a little off topic, but preferably what what do you like? Script driven cartoons or storyboard driven cartoons? I I think that they they scratch different itches. Mm. Like I would be very concerned about working on a script a, a storyboard driven movie. Mm -hmm. I, I and that by the way is is the way a lot of Disney movies happen. Um, I know that. Well, in sort of, they did. They don't now. Mm. Um, now there's a script. I was going to say, I, now it seems more calculated. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. I, I think that's useful. I think when you're dealing with long form, you need to have a script. I think you always need to be willing to look at what you've got and say, can this be improved? Particularly when you get that animatic happening. Yeah. Um, if you say the script is inviolate, you're setting yourself up for disaster yeah. because I'm sorry, the script is not the show. 
here's the show and now we need to look at what we're making and decide whether it's going to be good or not mm -hmm. um but for certainly for short form for 11 minutes and under i i think premise driven storyboard driven is the way to go because it allows you to explore you still need to have someone to pull it all together that's still happening in animatic yeah but um you know i've done i've done scripts for things like that i've done it from both sides and i know what's going to happen when my script gets put into storyboard it's going to function but it's going to miss out on a lot of opportunities yeah and there is some genuine fun and insanity and insight that you'll get from storyboarders because they're dealing with the the physical character in the physical space <laughs> and dealing with performance they're going to discover things that you can't discover and and the idea that your script is the end is insane yeah yeah no i i uh again i'm working on like a, a pilot myself right now in my free time and uh i started with a script um that i just boarded myself and uh I think the script ended up having to go through like 18 different revisions before it got to a point where I'm like, not happy with it, but whatever. It, it, it'll go yeah. until I can make the animatic. And while I'm doing the animatic, every single scene, I'm like, I need to change this line. Come back to, this line. <laughs> like, exactly. to the point where it's it's like, I think it's almost fully animated right now. I've got about like 14 to 15 minutes animated of it, of like 18. And I'm like, I'm not happy. I could change right. all of this if I, mean, I wanted to. I mean, that's that's the process, and that's the filmmaking process. And I I learned it, you know, really, really well and and impactfully because I went out and I made my own live action movie with with Micah Wright, my writing partner, my creative partner. Um, it was one of these first person. Uh, I'm not going to say it's a horror movie. It's more like a workplace comedy that turns into a horror movie. Um, Can you say but, what it's called? Oh, yeah. It's called They're Watching. It's been out for years. Oh. I mean, it did not set the world on fire. We did not have big you know, distribution. Guys? They're Watching. Um, so anyway, we we did this movie. And you, you go out. And we had a script, of course. And we filmed everything. And there was one scene where one of our characters goes off into the woods alone she's it's it, the story is um you've seen house hunters international home hunters international home hunters global what is it called <laughs> home hunters international okay so you know jay lender is a successful animator in los angeles and he's ready to re leave the hollywood rat race and have the fun life in europe so they take me to Europe and they show me three houses and then I, I pick one of now. them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And after the commercial break, we came back six months later to see how Jay is doing. So we made a movie that's about the crew coming back six months later to see how their American is doing in this little village in Moldova <laughs> where they dropped her off in this house. And when the crew comes back a year or six months later, she's great. The house is great gorgeous her life looks fantastic but the villagers are not happy with her <laughs> and the tr the crew it's an american crew goes tromping around town <laughs> pissing everybody off and things get weird Ooh. so there's a scene where one of the characters who is a newbie on the crew she's a, a pa has been banished from from the house by the producer of the show just like get out of my face Go do something else. Get me some B-roll footage. So she goes out and she's going to shoot pictures of logs and trees and whatever that they can cut into the show later. And she has this weird experience where she's filming the trees and suddenly a villager walks out from behind the tree and another villager walks out from behind another tree and they've got sides and pitchforks and it's freaky. <laughs> and then that ends and she goes on and has another weird experience. And we we wrote all of this stuff and we filmed all of this stuff and we cut it together. And the second we cut it together, and this is why I'm getting to this, we realized this doesn't work because there is no way after this person sees those villagers that she's not going to go back into the house. <laughs> so the second scene doesn't make sense anymore. And it made perfect sense when you're writing yeah. yeah it wasn't until you saw it and felt what she's feeling that you realized okay this is totally false so now we've got the scene with the villagers popping out from behind trees that we can't use mm. and we realized as we're editing the rest of this movie there's a moment 
like a minute and a half later where nothing very intense is happening, we would like something like that. We've still got this footage and it's all being filmed by that character. So she's not on screen. Mm. We could do yeah. anything with this. So we said, okay, we're going to write a new scene where the producer who banished her is so dissatisfied with what she got. She's like, I'll go out and do this myself. How hard can it be? So she goes out and, and we came up with this idea. We socked it into the film where it belongs. And then we called the actress who played the producer and said, here are your new lines. Can you record these for us? And she literally went into like the bathroom in an <laughs> airport on her phone wow. and recorded this dialogue. And then we invited over the other character who we were going to have come rescue her. Uh, we invited him to my house and we sit because we wanted better sound quality for him. If we could get it, we set up a microphone on a ladder in my backyard. So we, <laughs> we had to wait for the helicopters to stop flying by so we could get this audio out of him. And we got his lines and we got her lines and we cut them together and I added a bunch of crunching leaf noises so it would sound like they're walking around and like he runs up and all of this stuff. And we crafted a completely new scene. And you do this in live action all the time and we don't think about it. We feel yeah. like everyone, even professionals, feel like you have the actors perform their lines and you film it and that's the show. Yeah, that's but, figured out. But, but that's so not weird. what happens. You have the reverse shot and I'm facing this way. And the second my mouth is off camera, I can be saying anything the director needs me to say. Yeah, yep. I, I point that out all the time. I'm like, his mouth's not moving. Right. <laughs> yeah. or, or maybe it is. And it was saying something completely yeah. different. Yep. But <laughs> we realized that, you know, we cut this scene and we need that information to come out. We'll put it here because they're not facing the same way. It's all clay. It's always been clay. And that's the way you need to approach it. So the script is your roadmap and that helps you gather your material in animation or live action. Um, after that, it's in the editing room where the, the actual show is made. And the average person will not notice all that like reshuffling. No, they won't. No. Yeah. <laughs> they won't pick no. it up at all. <laughs> no, and you know, you learn, you learn that once you understand that that's where things happen, you learn to keep your eye open for it. So there, there was a moment in the, the story, and I won't spend any more time on this, but it's a fun one. The moment in the story where characters are walking through the town, it's supposed to be fun. And then there's going to be one little creepy moment in the middle of it, but because our characters don't know that anything weird is happening yet. And we wanted one of the villagers to walk by and our guy is filming. The Americans are tromping around filming everything everywhere they go. And that's not cool, but they're doing it. So one of the villagers walks by and she's supposed to go like this as she walks by because don't steal my soul. And we had an extra there who was, we told her, walk down this alley and then turn and go by the camera and just cover your face. And we showed her how to do it and she couldn't do it. She would walk by and we did it four or five times and she would go <laughs> like this. And it was, it was stiff. The, the fear wasn't being communicated. The discomfort wasn't being communicated. Yeah. We didn't like it. We were going to cut it. And we had a meeting with, um, two guys who had come out of Angry Beavers, who we knew, who are very successful live action filmmakers. And they said, they saw a rough cut and they're like, A, make it shorter. And B, when you go through your footage, look at heads and tails. So the very beginning of what you shot and the very end of what you shot. And that stuff goes way before you call action and way after you yell cut. Mm. And we found a shot of this old lady who we wanted to do the hand thing at the beginning of her shot, she's at the back of an alley and she's standing 20 yards away from us, waiting for us to call action. And she's got a loaf of bread under her arm and she's just going <laughs> like that. And we used just that Ugh. and then wrote some new dialogue for the camera guy to be saying as we saw it and it's creepy as fuck that's it's great smart. that's so smart but we didn't shoot it 
you know, it was an accident that happened during editing when when you're desperate and you just have to make it better and you yeah. do whatever it takes. You go yeah. through all the footage you have. You're like, what can we use? Mm-hmm. What you can we do? You realize that while working under restrictions, you can make something that is better than what you initially like envisioned. Yeah, yeah. and and the, the job is, is always to improve, not to be faithful to the last guy. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe there isn't room to improve. It's happened. But really what you want to do is recognize that whatever you're doing right now is a different task. And your job is to do that task as well as possible. And sometimes that means making changes. Yeah. yeah. But always for the better. It always ends up being for the better. Yeah. Unless you're Mark and have to rewrite your script 18 times. No, I'm teasing. No, it's, it's really good. It's really good. I promise. <laughs> and it'll be better when you have the animatic. Yeah. yeah no, that's the thing. I... I would edit, edit the animatic just to like show people and I'd be like, well, I want to change that. Now. And I got to the point where there were like 20 different drafts of the animatic to the point where I was like, okay, when the animator wants this, I will edit the scene when it. I need to edit it. You know, I'll have the rep animatic and whenever I need to do like start animating a scene, I will focus on that scene completely and like mm-hmm. make sure that's perfect and then sand it off and then focus on the next yeah. one and sand it off so that I, there's no more like... Because, yeah, yeah. I'm not having to, like, put my attention on every little thing. It's more, like, yeah, hyper-focused on the the single parts to make sure that all works well. And and when you uh, can, if you can, you can't always do this on on an actual production schedule. Yeah, yeah. But when you can, put it aside and then come back to it because it's been percolating in the back of your head. and, And the solution to the problem is ready to go when you come back, even though you haven't been thinking about it. Or yeah. worse, you see something where you're like, why did I think that was good? And then you suddenly <laughs> yeah. know what needs to be done. I hate moments like that, but I also love moments like that. I know. It got, <laughs> what would happen if we didn't have those moments? You I know. walk through your life <laughs> thinking everything was good enough. We <laughs> wouldn't have Pigeon Man. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'd be hard-pressed. I, I, I asked um, for some questions on Twitter. And a majority of them were, um, I'm, I'm sure you've answered these a million times, but uh, uh, um, favorite episodes that you worked on a SpongeBob? I don't know that I have answered those questions no? a million really? times. Really? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, certainly the the first one that I, the first one I storyboard wrote, because I worked on one or two episodes, I, I think Squeaky Boots and Pickles, <laughs> before I actually started writing, so... When I first got the job, I did a test for them. Derek called me and said, why don't you come in? We don't have anything for you to do yet, but why don't you wrangle these boards? So he gave me pickles and said, there's some stuff in here that doesn't make sense. Just take a pass at it. So that's what I was doing for a week or two before he finally said, all right, you got a job. Come on here. And he dragged me across the room of the street and put me in the room with Chuck Klein. He's like, this is your partner, Chuck. Here's your premise. Go. And suddenly I was a storyboard writer. So, you know, I, I loved Pickles because it was like a, a, a little taste of directing very yeah. early on because I was given the freedom to rework someone else's stuff. Um, but the first show was Hall Monitor. <laughs> and it was terrifying because I had no idea. I mean, I couldn't draw SpongeBob. I was still kind of new at storyboarding. I had never done writing like that. I'd never worked from a premise. I had never met Chuck. Um, everything about that process was just terrifying. Oh, and you new. nailed but that is, it. That is not conveyed through the final product. Yeah, that is all, iconic. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, we we. I think it's easy to be iconic when you have. A completely blank slate in terms of SpongeBob. I mean, the quality was there, and we had Steve and Derek backstopping us. So, you know, there are plenty of things in that that would have come from them, as mm-hmm. there would be with any episode. Um, but you know, it's when you have, and this is one of the reasons I don't envy people who work on SpongeBob now. We do SpongeBob. We can do SpongeBob, Sandy, and Patrick go to the moon, and. If you want to do a show, an episode now, you can do, okay, SpongeBob, Sandy, and Patrick go into outer space, but they don't go to the moon. They go to Venus and they do it so they can open up an ice cream parlor. You know, like how do you slot ideas in between 300 other episodes Ironically enough, a recent SpongeBob did have a plot of SpongeBob, Sandy, and I think it was Pearl and Patrick's (laughs) younger sister who they inserted into the show. 
going to the moon, <laughs> and uh, I think they have a conflict with Santa Claus. Well, I mean, you, I you have to. It, it has to get that granular in order to find virgin territory. Yeah. yeah. And we had the whole world open to us, so it's easy to do hall monitor, boom, because we were like, we have Mrs. Puff and, and the Driving Academy. What's a school story? Hall monitor, boom, you're done. You only get a couple of those before you start stepping on the toes yeah. of other stories. So it was easy to be iconic if we're iconic. I loved that. I, I certainly loved um, uh, the Fry Cook games. <laughs> the Fry Cook um, games. I, I got to you know really play like doing the the uh, Neptune stuff. I love Neptune. <laughs> you know, just, like I, I did that whole bake off between the two of them in, in the ring and I oh. essentially played it straight. Steve and Derek added a, a bunch of the gags. Like, in the old Steve tickets. added that that stuff. <laughs> I was doing the big gestures and all of that stuff because <laughs> growing the weeds. It was scratching my Disney itch, oh. you know, working with essentially King Triton. Um, so so I, that was fun. I got to do that. I was, I mean, I was drawing, I was drawing on like 16 field paper for that one because I just couldn't do those drawings. Oh, tiny, tiny little back thumbnails. Then. Um, yeah. I love that graveyard shift. I was going to say know. you did the Nosferatu joke. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's just a, a dumb throwaway gag, but one of the few that I got to do that was like truly weird. Yeah, yeah so that, that scared me as a kid. I, that like Sorry. genuinely scared. I was like, "What is? Who is this?" <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like, "Why is he smiling?" <laughs> what is um? So someone offhandedly mentioned this in my replies too, asking a question. It was a, a board that you drew, and it was I think it was from Graveyard Shift, a, a deleted scene, a little guy in the floorboard. Yeah, that's floorboard Harry. It's it's the sort of origin of the Nosferatu gag. Yeah, really. Um, and you know, I I feel like, and I've said this before, and I don't know that it's true. I've never verified it, but I I feel like. Um, one of the reasons I didn't have a lot of weird gags, because I pitched some weird gags, but they almost never went. And I feel like my job was to sort of stay in the pocket and deliver a show that functioned. So Paul and Aaron and Sherm and Carl could swing for the bleachers. Yeah. And they hit or they miss. It works or it doesn't work. But there will be one half of the show that functions. You know, like it, it's it's a solid SpongeBob story, and everybody's happy, and and no one's like, uh, and hopefully I didn't do too many episodes that were, Ehh. so I didn't get a, a lot of opportunities to do that, and maybe I'm completely wrong in my assessment of that. But what happened with Floorbird Harry was was this: there's the scene where SpongeBob is talking about all the great things that he's going to do at night. I'm chopping the <laughs> lettuce at night, and I'm flipping patties at night. And there were three beats, because you do three beats, and the third one is the weird one. And for whatever reason, we had four. And the fourth one was going to be the weird one. So right now, I think it's, um, I burned my hand yeah. at night. Is That's <laughs> the weird one. That's the one that, that flips the, the script on you. But I had treated that as a, the sort of third normal beat. And then the fourth one was the weird one. I'm delivering the mail to Floorboard Harry at night <laughs> and it was completely out of nowhere he runs in lifts up a section of floorboard and you can just see like an eye down there and he hands down the mail and a hand comes up and grabs it and then he slams it shut and that's it and it was just a weird non sequitur and then when the end of the show came up and we needed something to do who's flipping the lights we whip over and it's floorboard Harry. And what I had drawn was a section of floor standing up and you could just see the two legs coming out and one <laughs> hand holding it up and the eye in the knot hole. And he's flipping the light. Yeah. But when Derek and Steve said, we don't need floorboard Harry in the beginning, we were stuck with floorboard <laughs> Harry at the end, <laughs> ending the show. Yeah. And that that comes was from? a real, that was a non sequitur. That was a big non sequitur, <laughs> but it didn't seem weird in that, I mean, it didn't seem weird in a good way in that context. Yeah. Yeah. It was just too, what, wait, who, what, why? And I figured if we're gonna have that reaction, we should go all the way. <laughs> so I, 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 I think in the the intervening two decades, I've put together where that came from in my head, and that's that I needed a scary non sequitur image. And for me, growing up, 
a little kid in the 70s and 80s, I was reading a magazine called Famous Monsters, uh, previously Famous Monsters of Filmland. And they would talk about all of the great horror movies the of mummy, the past. The werewolf, Dracula. Everything. And weird stuff, little stuff, and silent stuff, all of it. Um, there was no way to see those things unless they showed up on television or you rented a theatrical circuit print. Like, the, we used to have catalogs you could rent 16 millimeter movies for, you know, like the the synagogue fundraiser. <laughs> you, you do a, a fun fair and we're running a movie in the next room. Um, there was no, certainly no way to see a silent movie on television. So I had seen them talking about Nosferatu for years in this magazine and other places without having seen the movie when I was a kid. And there was always that photo of him standing in that doorway with the arms <laughs> down. And it's terrifying and it's connecting to nothing in your head because all you've got is, is this that photo. <laughs> so when I, I guess at some level, I'm thinking I need a scary non sequitur image. That's it. Boom. <laughs> so we went looking for that image and I, I handed that off to Nick Jennings who blew it up and did the painting stuff and there we are. Yeah, That's how it happened. Yeah. <laughs> that smile is what scared I mean, me. It's, it's, that was, that a, was it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a stupid, it's a stupid, dumb, non sequitur gag. It's hilarious. It's now. all I've got and yeah. it'll be on my tombstone. It's, it's weird so enough good. to where you don't realize or you don't care that the episode has no <laughs> conclusion. No. But it's it's um, so good. Yeah. It's perfect enough. What's weird about it now is we're now 20 years later and they've done a couple of appearances. I was going to ask you. Yeah. yeah. So they, they do appearances on the SpongeBob show, and now he's showing up as Camp Kid Feratu yeah. on Camp Coral. And what's crazy about it is that it began as a non sequitur, but now it's a continuity gag. So there are kids in the world right now, growing up, who know that character primor uh, prim primarily from the other show. They think yeah. it's a SpongeBob. Uh, right. Yeah, SpongeBob, SpongeBob character. character. Yeah. <laughs> right. And when they see the the uh, graveyard shift episode, they're like, oh, he's still there. It's not weird anymore. Yeah. It's yeah, a just... it's a different kind of weird. Yeah. You know, I, and I don't I don't know what kind of weird it is. Um, and maybe something is lost, or maybe I not maybe. I'm kind of sitting back enjoying the fact that it's become a, a new thing that I can't Everyone understand gets to, anymore. Yeah. Everyone gets to share this this childhood memory. Of yours, it's like it has yeah. flown the nest. It's something completely different now. That's all I associate it with is yeah. SpongeBob. <laughs> Have you seen the original movie? Yet? No. Do okay. Is it good. It's fantastic. Oh, and then okay. the the remake that was done. They did a remake the, in the late seventies, early eighties, right oh. on the cusp, is amazing. They're both great. Okay, we'll, check it out we'll do it then. It's you know, vampire as pestilence he is a play living plague <laughs> and it's creepy as hell it's great Ooh. well maybe that'll scare me more than the spongebob one did <laughs> <laughs> well you're you're not a little kid anymore yeah very true yeah. very true <laughs> i am a man <laughs> <laughs> so I got not. that. Yes. It's not even one of mine, but I got it. <laughs> I think that's a good, yeah. that's, that's a good solid uh, place to yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on to our podcast. Yeah. Thank you for answering all of our fun. questions. I'm, I'm just so giddy with joy from all this. <laughs> um, uh, is there anything you, you are up to now that you'd like to promote? I know you put the there, There's a lot of stuff that's about to happen, Ooh. but it's all been about to happen for about 10 months. <laughs> and I, I, I'm hesitant to talk about some that's of it. Fair. So that's fair. Hopefully there will be some incredibly good news soon. We'll you know, see. when well, it does come out, we'll put it in the description of this video. Yeah, I look forward to it. Sure. Yeah. You can all, can I plug something? I should yes, of course. It. I have to plug it because I've got a garage full of copies of Duster, the graphic novel that I did with Micah Wright, my creative partner. Um, if you go to jlender.com, you can find your way to it. And it's super cool, I think. We'll put a link in the description too, so you guys can get a copy yourself. Thank you. Of course. Thank you again for, oh, I'm so, mm -hmm. I'm just, oh, I'm over the moon. <laughs> Happy to be here. Um, stay tuned, fellers. Bye.